those who stay on the Friday afternoon uh, for, for this session. It's an interesting topic about aspirin for primary prevention. It was also my, my first uh, grant from the Swiss National Foundation about uh, 12 years ago. Uh, because there was a first recommendation about using aspirin for primary prevention in the United States, so to broadly use it, and we thought we should better assess who, who will be the patient who, who will uh, benefit from that. So it's a, a topic as it is uh, very important for me, and I am going also to, to show what is uh, the changes over time about the new knowledge we, we got from this uh, topic. So I will begin with a, a bit of background and discuss shortly the clinical trials of primary prevention with aspirin. There are not so much, there are six trials. And then I think the most important concern for clinicians is what are the benefits and risks, particularly in the context of primary prevention, I think for secondary prevention after acute coronary syndrome, the situation is clear. So benefits are, are far higher than the risk, uh, but in primary prevention, the benefits are smaller because of the lower risk. What made a big change also I found in the knowledge we had about aspirin is this uh, individual patient data analysis on aspirin for primary prevention published in the Lancet where they reassess what were the benefits, but also what were the risk of the patient, particularly is the bleeding risk. Then what are the current recommendations? You will see as for several recommendations, it goes in a lot of different directions. Uh, we have also done a small study in, uh, in Lausanne about what the use of aspirin uh, for primary prevention in Switzerland and how it looks like and if it is appropriate or not and then some personal conclusion on who should get aspirin for primary prevention. So the background is there is a quite a long story about aspirin for primary prevention as they were during a long time, there were only two trials. And the, the big issue was that one trial was clearly positive and the other one was really negative. So one US trial, the physician health study found a 44% reduction of fatal and non-fatal MI among uh, doctors who had, a, had no history of cardiovascular disease. So quite effective, seems to be quite a great preventive therapy in this trial, but almost at the same time was a British male doctor study, so the similar population also by physician, and in this trial, he, uh, they didn't find any difference in the risk of myocardial infarction. So it, the situation was unclear during many years. Then there were four additional major trials looking at aspirin for primary prevention and two meta-analyses of the five trials where they found that the benefit was mainly in patients who were at high cardiovascular risk in which the benefits were higher than the, the risk. After uh, Paul Ritker published in the New England in 2005, the first large trial in women, because women were mostly excluded or were a very small group of the other trial, and they found something interesting who, that also add to the controversy that uh, it was a trial only in women, a very large study of 40,000 women, and they found that there was a benefit in women, but only for stroke. There was 19% reduction in the risk of stroke, for women who are healthy, so in primary prevention, but they didn't find any benefit uh, for myocardial infarction. So there was a lot of discussion if it was a change findings that we found only in women, this difference, or if it was really a gender uh, difference. I just want to, to show one example of one trial. So the physician health study that you, it's also important to see how large is the absolute risk reduction uh, for, and what are also the absolute risks. So if you look at the relative risk reduction in this trial, it was very large, 44%. We don't, uh, with, in several uh, statin trials, we don't reach also so much uh, relative risk reduction, perhaps except in, in the recent uh, Jupiter uh, study with rosuvastatin. But if you look at the actual number, it's a small reduction. There was also an increase, a clear increase in the side effects, uh, including for uh, cerebral bleeding, which was very small, but at the individual level could play a role. So in, in the placebo group, as compared to the aspirin group, there were twice more uh, cases of cerebral bleeding, which is quite a big concern, even if the number is small, because it's in healthy people. So people were uh, 
healthy, have no symptoms, and then uh, twice more uh, got the bleeding with aspirin. So this, is, this was the main concern of the U.S. Preventive Task Force uh, when they assessed in 2002 all the data about aspirin. It, on, in which groups there was a benefit, a clear benefit compared to the risk. And what is uh, interesting in this table is that you can see they put, so it's the data of all uh, five large trials, and they put what is the five-year cardiovascular risk of the people, then what was the number needed to treat. So if you treat very low risk people, so 1% of risk over five years, so low risk population, to prevent one cardiovascular heart disease event, you, you need to treat a lot of people, so more than 300. And what is interesting, they compare it with the risk. The risk is small, as there is a risk of one uh, hemorrhagic stroke if you look at uh, 1,000 people and there is a risk of 3 GI bleeding. So the number needed to arms that you have to compare with the number needed to treat was 1,000 for hemorrhagic stroke and was 300 for major GI bleeding. So if you treat very low risk people you have almost more uh, you have more risks than benefit. You are more likely to bleed than to have a prevention of cardiovascular, uh, a cardiovascular event. If you move toward higher risk, like this group, a 5% risk over five years, so which translates about a 10% risk over 10 years, so which is a, would be an intermediate risk population, then it becomes to be more attractive to take aspirin. So you had a number needed to treat of 71, and the number needed to arm in this analysis was the same. So they, they postulated that the risk of bleeding would be similar across the cardiovascular risk based on the published data. And it is something that has now changed in the, uh, in the last analysis where they have pulled all individual participant data. So from this recommendation, they told likely there is a benefit of aspirin if you have a a five-year risk of 5% or perhaps even with a risk of 3% over five years. This was a recommendation of the U.S. Preventive Task Force in 2002 to give aspirin uh, if you have a risk more than 6 or more than 10% for the American Heart Association based on this study level uh, data. Then I think a paper that for me also changed a lot the, the current situation is this. Uh, there is a large collaboration, the anti-thrombotic trialist collaboration, where they put all data, all individual data from all patients who have been in this trial of uh, aspirin for primary prevention. And you will see that with this individual data, we could better assess the risk, particularly the risk of bleeding. So, what they found it was quite similar to what was found in the single trial. So there was a benefit on non-fatal MI, about 23%, likely a slight overestimation in the physician health study where they found 44%. There was no significant benefit on death. For strokes, they didn't find a significant benefit uh, and including for stroke deaths, there was also no benefit. So only this single trial in women found a slight reduction of uh, stroke. But when you look at all individual patients, you didn't find a significant benefit on stroke. And other va vascular deaths were also not prevented with aspirin. Overall, for serious vascular events, they had a 12% relative risk reduction, so a more conservative estimate than what was found in the single trial. Most interesting, they were also able to look at the risk of bleeding according to cardiovascular risk. Uh, you have in this graphic from the Lancet, so you have the different risk groups. So this is a, the group with five-year risk less than 5%. Then you have in this 5 to 10%, and these groups uh, more than 10%. And you have the absolute risk reduction. You have the two groups, the group aspirin, the control group. And in blue, you have what is the benefit in terms of cardiovascular disease. And as we see already in the group with a five-year risk, the benefit 
if you look at the absolute risk, is quite small with a small increased risk of bleeding, which is also small. What was quite new in this study, if you look at the risk, the group with a higher cardiovascular risk, so this is more than 10% over five years, which is about, uh, about the same than a 20% risk over 10 years, so the high-risk population, you had a benefit from aspirin, so going from 16% risk of cardiovascular disease to 14%. So you had a benefit of 2%. So it means you had a number needed to treat. So if you treat 50 patients with aspirin in primary prevention, you can prevent one myocardial infarction. And likely what they found also is that the risk of bleeding was also related to cardiovascular risk. So if you were uh, in the iris group, your risk of bleeding was also far higher than if you were in the group with a low cardiovascular risk. So you prevent one event if you give aspirin to 100 people, you could prevent two events, but you also cause one extra GI bleeding or unlikely also some cerebral bleeding. So that the risk benefit in the high risk group was not so clear than when we were looking at the study level meta-analysis. And they look also at different group of age and sex and didn't find also that the group really clearly benefit from aspirin in primary prevention. Uh, Based on this data, there were several updates of the guidelines who should get aspirin in primary prevention. And as you see also from the data, they're not totally clear. Unlikely, these recommendations are uh, somewhat contra conflicting. So the American College of Chest Physicians recommended to take uh, daily aspirin for people over 50. But they recognize that the benefits are small. And when you explain the risk of bleeding, likely a lot of people are going to decline when they are healthy. They clearly recommend not to give aspirin on people who are on under anticoagulant, I think, which is clear. So the European Society of Cardiology was far more careful about aspirin for primary prevention because they recommend not to use aspirin or clopidogrel for any group due to the risk of bleeding. So people from the uh, diabetology field were less careful, even when you look at the specific subgroup for the, with patients with diabetes, the benefit of aspirin seems to be even a bit smaller than among people without diabetes, without very clear explanation. The recommendation was very broad before from the American Diabetes Association. So to broadly use aspirin in pay people with diabetes, it was in all the guidelines, was also a quality measurement of treatment of diabetes. And so they now accept to give less aspirin, but still a larger group because it's all diabetic people with a risk over 10%, especially men over 50 or women over 60 with one risk factor. So a large, risk, uh, large group because a lot of diabetes, diabetic people have one risk factor. So U.S. Preventive Task Force, they, they, they change also their recommendation, make it also more careful. Also, they make it very complex. I'm not sure that any uh, doctor can really know this recommendation in clinical practice, particularly GP. So they make use of aspirin depending on the risk, depending on age, depending on stroke risk for women. And if you are above this cutoff and you don't take N NSAIDs, or any story of GI bleeding, you are eligible for aspirin. I'm almost finished. And then the aspirin use, uh, we look how aspirin was used in primary prevention in uh, f uh, about 5,700 5, people in Lausanne, so a random sample of the population. And we found that quite a lot of people, uh, also low-risk people, were taking aspirin, like this group, 6 to 10%. Almost 10% of the people are taking daily aspirin without clear benefit, given the new data. And among people with diabetes, more than 25% take daily aspirin, also when the data are not so good. So it seems 
uh, overuse in low risk people. So the conclusion I think from this data is there is a risk also for aspirin about hemorrhagic stroke and GI bleeding, and it may be great, greater than any benefit in person at low risk. So several guidelines that recommend to use aspirin, but in this guideline, it should be focused on people at greater cardiovascular risk because also the bleeding risk increase with increasing cardiac risk, which makes also this recommendation more difficult to apply in clinical practice. And to, with all this literature and following this field over the last 10 years, I think the groups that should be uh, a good target for aspirin in primary prevention is, to my opinion, uh, raise a small group, so it could be high-risk patient when you have really no other cardiovascular risk factors to be treated. So if you have a, people have already stopped smoking, you have already treated the lipids, and you still have high-risk people or they don't have an elevated uh, lipid level, a strong family history, perhaps for these small groups there might be an indication, but when we compare the data about statin use, where we have a clear benefit and the risk of side effect is very small. I think the place for aspirin primary prevention, to my opinion, is small, but I can uh, answer question about that. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Odondi, for this excellent talk. Are there any questions? So you say definitely it, uh, aspirin is not, as primary prevention is not for everyone, so. I think we, we have so much now as a possibility, including in primary prevention, so treating blood pressure, treating stat, uh, lipid levels with statin, where we have clear data about the benefit, at least in the high-risk people, with very low risk of side effect. It would really be like a last choice to use aspirin in primary prevention. I, I, I would rather give my patient a, a statin if he is at high risk and giving aspirin because I, I know I, I won't cause side effect if I don't have too many medication or too many uh, other contraindications for statin. So even if the Swiss Medical Board now tell us that we should not use any more statin if you don't have a risk of, of, having, uh, of dying in the next 10 years, or so almost to nobody we should give statin. I still think it, it's a far safer ther therapy as aspirin. Thank you. Okay.